friends, we're so glad that you've joined us. I'm Daniel Perrin, and we are studying through the Sabbath School quarterly of second quarter 2024, which is on the topic of the great controversy, which is a story, a story that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we are involved in that story, and we are nearing the end, both in the study right now, lesson number 11, and in all time, the universe, looking forward to a great conclusion. I want to share with you and introduce you to our panelists who will be studying with us today. Next to me, we have Pastor John. John Dinsey. It's a blessing to be here and I have Monday, the coming crisis. Thank you. Looking forward to the coming crisis and who brings us through it. Then we have Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Daniel. I have Tuesday's lesson, which is in identifying the beast part one. All right. Mm. And then Pastor John Lomacang. I guess it's a James and John thing. I have identifying the beast part two. Part two. Okay. All right. And then we finally conclude with Ryan Day. Are we doing a part three? Oh, uh, no, but we certainly have uh, Thursday's lesson, which is entitled the beast from the earth. All right, I know that this is information that you want to hear, and so we're going to get right into it in a moment. If, as we present, you think to yourselves, I'd like to know that information that they were sharing, send us an email, ssp at 3abn.org, and you will then be on the list to get the Sabbath School panelists' notes each week uh, that they use as they prepare. Before we get started, let's seek the Lord in prayer. Pastor Rafferty, would you lead us? Sure. Father, we just want to thank you again for this opportunity to seek your guidance. The Holy Spirit promised to each one of us, to our viewers, to ourselves. As we open the pages of the Bible, we're asking for light and understanding that will help guide our feet, especially in the times in which we live. So do this for us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My name is Daniel Perrin, and I have lesson for Sunday's lesson, Revelation's Final Conflict. Now, this week's lesson goes along with chapters 35 and 36 in the book, The Great Controversy. That's the chapters entitled, Liberty of Conscience Threatened and the Impending Conflict. In the book, The Great Controversy, there are chapters that speak about things past. There are chapters that speak about things future. And there are past chapters that speak about spiritual issues in the conflict of all time. But then there are chapters like these that describe events that we are a part of right now. And so what we need now is what we have in this memory text for this week. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. I think it's wonderful that God has made his word plain. This is simple stuff right here. No mental gymnastics to understand your word is truth. Reminds me of Deuteronomy 30 verse 11. For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. Praise the Lord. We can understand what he's going to give us today. I want to note two sentences out of Sabbath's lesson. Uh, it says this in the second paragraph. Specifically, the Sabbath will become the center of a global conflict over worship. There will be a collision of beliefs over the true and false day of worship. Sabbath is going to be the issue. The Sabbath itself as a weekly day of rest and communion with God and with each other, that's important. But why the Sabbath? Why is that the final issue in Satan's attempt to steal and replace the identity of God? In war terminology, why is the Sabbath the stronghold that must be either taken or, or, or held? Why not some of the, one of the other nine commandments? Why that? As I share why, I want to remind you that disregarding any of God's commandments shows that in our heart we do not love God and we would not be happy obeying him in heaven. But the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath is unique. Of the, of the, six, the last six commandments are familiar to people all over the world. Don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, uh, don't lie, don't bear false witness. Buddhists, Hindus, non-religious people all over the world advocate for those commandments. Uh, they, they see a utilitarian rationale for not stealing and not committing adultery sometimes or not killing, but they are not obeying God, but they still look like they are. In fact, some governments around the world legislate some of these commandments. 
The first four commandments, on the other hand, they're different. They deal with God specifically. And any believer, any spiritual or religious believer can take the words of, of some of these first four commandments, regardless of who they claim as their God. Uh, religious people could take that commandment, don't build any idols, don't put any other gods before me, don't take my name in vain. But the Sabbath is different. Rest for this particular 24-hour period in every seven-day cycle. There is no rational reason for that except honoring the God revealed in this Bible right here who created our world in seven literal 24-hour connected contiguous days. The lesson refers us to the great controversy, page 605. The keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. And so this, the, the Sabbath day of all the other commandments points to the God that is revealed in the Bible, this particular God, the one who created. And when we submit to, in love, submit in love to the God who is the creator, then we are also identifying him and accepting him as our loving sustainer and our trustworthy lawgiver and the final judge who has authority over all life. The Sabbath day is what reveals God's character of love for the people he's created. And that's the character of God that Satan absolutely hates. So his desire, uh, Satan's desire, the enemy is to catch everybody and turn them away from this God of love. And so he's going to set a trap. And in order to do that, he is going to test us to the limits. But he's not going to start with the final test. That would not be a good idea. Springing that trap too soon would be too obvious and it would unmask his deception. And so he's got to work his way up to that slowly. Look at how he did that with Jesus in the wilderness when the enemy tempted him there. Did he start with the temptation, bow down and worship me? No, he started with bread, appetite. And that's just where he started with Adam and Eve. He started with appetite. In fact, Satan didn't even need to test Adam and Eve on the issue of the Sabbath because he already defeated them with appetite. There's a sobering reality here, and that is that many Seventh-day Adventists and Christians, despite uh, other Christians of other denominations, despite counsel we have from God's word and other light that has been given us through Ellen White, we refuse to give God our loyalty and our worship in the area of our appetite. And so for many of us, perhaps, the enemy doesn't even need to test us on the Sabbath because he already has us on appetite. We don't want to hear it. We refuse to read about it. Appetite simply means what I want. And we want what we want. And this is in all areas of appetite. Music, movies, spending, eating and drinking, clothing, cars and houses, popularity and acceptance. I want those things. And so many professors of God's truth then choose themselves as Lord. I want what I want. But there are a few who will not be disloyal to God for anything. And so the enemy is going to test them on everything. And he is going to do his best to rip them away from loyalty to God. Revelation 14 verse 12 has become their literal identity. The patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They have by faith accepted Jesus' righteousness and the law is no longer an external motivating factor. They follow the lamb so closely that the law that is in his heart has become a part of their heart too. And for them, Satan is laying a long-term plan as a last ditch effort to defeat Defeat, deceive if possible, even the elect, but he has to be secretive about it. Five volume of the testimonies, 452, the Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. 
Testimonies, volume 7, page 14. Those who place themselves under God's control to be led and guided by him will catch the steady tread of the events ordained by him to take place. While people say, we live in a free country, that could never happen here. Meanwhile, legislation is passed that gives unbridled authority to a small group in times of emergency. Financial changes permit digitizing currency so access can be shut off quickly. Religious leaders are acknowledged as moral and political authorities. An aggressive cancel culture humiliates anyone who dissents from the majority. Sunday is broadly accepted as a rest day for the health of the planet and evolution has become the dogma of the ages. By these and other hidden means, the enemy is crafting an impending conflict, the title of this week's lesson. What does impending conflict mean? I'm holding in my hand here a rat trap. As I slowly now pull back the hammer, very slowly, incrementally now, every change of position is so slight as to be unnoticed. Looking at the trap, the color is the same, the footing is secure, the foundation hasn't moved a bit. You can hardly notice the changes that are taking place but every incremental adjustment here puts tension onto this spring. And what I'm creating is an impending conflict, little by little. And that's what's happening in our world today, politically, financially, socially, economically, spiritually, there is an impending conflict until the trap is fully and completely set. And so now with this picture, we can begin to visualize what is written in the ninth, in the eighth volume of the testimonies. In the ninth volume of the testimonies, page 11, the agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world and the final events will be rapid ones. Now that's actually good news for those who recognize that God is taking them through a conflict and it will be over soon. Listen to this statement in eighth volume of the testimonies, page 23. The end is very near. We who know the truth should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. Not soon to break upon God's people as an overwhelming surprise, but soon to break upon the world. We see the impending conflict coming. We have our eyes looking at all those things that we have been told to watch and we recognize that though it appears that there is freedom to worship as we want to now, there are, are things happening in all these areas of the world that are preparing for the moment when the enemy will spring his trap and say, worship me or else you'll lose your life. But we take that promise seriously in Colossians 3, verse 3, that our life is hidden with Christ in God. Remember, there's nothing that the enemy can do to take our life when it is with Christ. We are told now to fear not. Fear not you who fear the Lord. Listen to the promise in Proverbs 18, 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. In the impending conflict, we have a place of safety and it is a place that we can trust. Amen. 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 Praise Amen. the Lord. We are glad you're safe from that trap. <laughs> Well, uh, my name is John Dinsey and I have Monday's portion, The Coming Crisis, The Coming Crisis, and I'm going to read directly from the lesson because it sets the stage for the lesson. And it says, the mark of the beast prophecy in Revelation 13 tells us about the fiercest and very worst stage of Satan's war against God. Ever since Jesus died on the cross, the enemy has known he was defeated but he is determined to take as many as possible down with him. His, his first strategy in this campaign is deception. When deception does not work, he resorts to force. He is ultimately behind the decree that anyone who refuses to worship the beast or receive his mark will be put to death. Religious persecution, of course, is not new. It has been around ever since Cain killed Abel for obeying God's command. Jesus said it would even happen among believers. Now this is a thought that we need to consider. 
And the lesson brings a question, considering some verses that I'm about to share, and is what did the New Testament church experience and how does that apply to Christ's end time church? We are living in the time of the end. A crisis is coming. And we have to ask ourselves, what is going to be my role? Am I going to be worshiping God? Or am I going to be worshiping the beast and his image? Am I going to receive the mark? Or am I going to be faithful to the Lord? John 16, verse 2 says, They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. These are the words of Jesus. And in some cases throughout history, there was some of that. Some people were thinking, I'm doing the service of God. Right. We have an example uh, with uh, Paul. He thought he was doing God's service. Matthew 10, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. By the grace of the Lord, you and I can endure to the end. 2 Timothy 3.12, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Well, why is that? Why is that? It's because we are in a great controversy between good and evil. And Satan will see to it that you have some suffering of some kind. Acts chapter 14, verse 21 and 22, notice what the Bible says. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconian, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. We're going to face difficulties. We're going to face perhaps persecution. We're going to face difficult times. And our hold and our strength is Jesus. Acts 24, verse 28 through 30. Notice, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Paul here is warning us that the time was coming that even from among the believers were, were going to arise people to draw some of the uh, church members away. And we need to be aware of this, that even from among us, somebody may do this, even in your own church. You know, the Bible tells us that within the church are wheat and tares. But now, it's not our job to say, ah, I think that guy over there, he's a tear. I think that person over there, but I'm a wheat. Yeah. Let's go ahead and uh, consider this statement from the book Evangel Evangelism, page 199. You heard it before, I think last week. And it says, are our feet on the rock of ages? Are we hiding ourselves in our only refuge? Uh, the storm is coming, relentless in its fury. Are we prepared to meet it? Are we one with Christ as he is one with the Father? Are we heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ? Are we working in co-partnership with Christ? Notice the statements. They're all relating to being united with God, being united with Christ. And this is how you can face the storm. Amen. You know, my father uh, used to say some things that I still remember about the coming times. And he said, you know, the devil couldn't destroy the church with persecution. So he took another strategy to work from within to try this, to destroy the church. And we see, we can look at history and see how this happened. And so 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Throughout church history, persecution, we have seen it. And when we look at history, what do we see? We see that among the Jews, they started uh, persecuting Christ, the disciples. And at first, uh, you see the scribes and the Pharisees leading out in persecuting the disciples of Christ. The Romans would look at that and say, what's, what's wrong with these people? They're fighting among themselves. 
they thought the Christians were just part of the, the same Jewish uh, beliefs. And to some degree, they were. But the Christians were trying to bring the everlasting good news, the everlasting gospel, and unfolding the light that was revealed by Christ. And of course, there was rejection by m the most of the Jewish uh, believers. And then the Romans started persecuting the Christians also. And persecution continued, and eventually, even from among the pure church, arose a movement that you will hear about in a moment, a movement, and it grew and it grew even bigger and greater than the, 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 those that re chose to remain faithful to God. And they became a small, what you, the Bible calls a remnant. And so let's consider Revelation 13, uh, verses 15 through 17. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. This is coming. This crisis is coming. And the question is, are you prepared? Would you be prepared if it was next week? The devil, the lesson brings out, the devil is already preparing professed Christians to receive the mark of the beast. When the final test comes by encouraging them to make, pro, uh, co to make compromises in their lives, when it appears that the whole world is following the beast and wondering in admiration, Revelation 13, 3, suddenly the scene changes and the prophetic camera focuses on God's people. So question, who is the war against? Who are they persecuting? Who is getting persecuted? We know that they are those that are faithful to the Lord. They're, those that are faithful to the Lord are being persecuted, and they are identified uh, in the scriptures. Uh, but first, you know, we hear this, and a lot of people, oh, no, persecution is coming, a crisis is coming. Some people get afraid. Some people get nervous. And I've heard people say, I don't want to go through the time of trouble. I hope the Lord puts me to rest before that time comes. And it may be that the Lord will put you to rest before that time comes. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. We need, not to, we need to trust in the Lord and not in ourselves. And if you're going to, through difficulties now, remember, God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble, and he will be very present help in the time of the crisis. Mm -hmm. God will be with his people, and they will be faithful. Now, who is the war against? Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 helps us to understand this. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed, New King James says, with the rest of her offsprings. Who are they? who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that in the time of the end, this is going to be the focus of persecution. Those that are faithful to God, they want to keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now you're going to hear more, so don't fall asleep. Continue listening as uh, we continue with the next day. Thank you, Pastor Dinsey. There is a lot more to share, so we'll be right back to finish. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the Three Avian Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back. Before we move on to Tuesday's lesson, one more word from Pastor Dinsey. Yes, I want to make a correction. I said Acts, Acts chapter 24, verses 28 to 30, but it's Acts chapter 20, verses 28 to 30 that I quoted. 
Great catch. Mm -hmm. All right, we're on Tuesday's lesson. My name is James Rafferty, and we have the title, Identifying the Beast, Part 1. So I'm thankful that I don't have to exhaust this whole uh, subject in this 10 minutes. We're going to pass it on to Pastor Loma King for Part 2. Let's get started in Revelation chapter 13, Identifying the Beast, verses 1 and 2. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, John says, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and seat and great authority. John is looking back in history here. He's identifying another beast, that is another earthly power or kingdom, because that's what a beast represents according to Daniel 7, verses 17 and 23, rising up out of the sea, a multitude, nations, peoples, and tongues, Revelation 17, verse 15. And as he sees this earthly power rising up, he sees a connection between previous powers. He starts with the seven horns. That takes us to the nations of Europe, according to Daniel chapter 7. They have crowns, so we're talking about monarchies here. And then he sees, in the context of this, the beast is like a leopard. That takes us to Greece. The beast has the mouth of a lion. That takes us to Babylon. The feet of a bear, Medo-Persia and also the beast receives its seat and authority from the dragon. Let's identify the dragon in the context of this history. The book of Revelation, the quarterly goes on to say, identifies the dragon primarily as Satan. Revelation 12, 3 through 5 says, the dragon attempted to destroy the man-child as soon as he was born. So let's just read there in Revelation chapter 12. There appears a great wonder in heaven, verse 1, a woman clothed with the sun, standing on the moon, a crown of 12 stars on her feet, and she's with child, verse 2, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Now a woman in Bible prophecy represents a church. A pure woman, as we see here, is God's church from which the remnant comes that John, Pastor John already identified, the remnant that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. This is the Jewish church because it's giving birth to the man-child, Jesus Christ. How do we know that this is Jesus Christ that's being depicted here as the man-child? Because he is born and then caught up to heaven and rules the nations with a rod of iron. That's what we read about here in Revelation 12 and verse 5. But the key verse we want to focus on is verse 2, excuse me, verse 4. Uh, and there appeared another wonder in heaven, verse 3, Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars, verse 4, from heaven, and it cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, if you think about this, it doesn't make sense. If you look at it literally, a dragon standing before a woman seeking to devour a child before it's born, it doesn't make sense. So this is definitely something. Symbolic. And as we've identified the symbol of the woman, we also want to identify the symbol of the dragon. If we identify this child as Christ, we know that Christ was born and, his, and a, an attempt was made on this life very early. We find this in the book of Matthew. Matthew uh, chapter 2, verses 16 through 18. Herod was the king. He was a vassal of the po uh, re, uh, Roman pagan, pagan Roman power. And when Herod was king, the wise men came seeking for Christ. The star was directing them to the Messiah because they wanted to herald his birth. And as, he, as they came looking for Christ, they came to Herod. And Herod, of course, felt like Christ would be contender to him and so for the throne. And so Herod was jealous. And in his jealousy, he subtly uh, deceived the wise men and told them, listen, when you find out about the birth of the Christ and where his birth is, you let me know because I want to go and worship him too. Well, he didn't want to worship him at all. He wanted to destroy him. But the wise men were warned in a dream not to return back to Herod after they had uh, given their gifts to Christ and acknowledged him as Messiah. They were to go a different way. And so Herod, after a few years, realized he'd been duped by the wise men. We pick up the, the story here in, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked by the wise men, was exceeding wroth. He sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time, 
which he had diligently, in, diligently inquired of the wise men. So basically what's happening here in Revelation chapter 12 is a summary of this history. The birth of Christ to the Jewish church, and as he's born, Herod is seeking to destroy him because he sees him as a contender for his own throne. And then we see a picture symbolically of the dragon seeking to destroy the child. That's because the dragon is represented by pagan Rome at the birth of Jesus Christ. What we're seeing here is a very important principle, and that is the dragon, who's identified as Satan, the devil, in, Re in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, works through earthly powers. Please don't miss this. This is going to really help us as we move on to our next lesson and we continue to identify this beast. A beast is an earthly power. Sometimes, you know, we, the mark of the beast and we get, oh, what is that? What is the beast? It must be some terrible looking dragon-like figure. No, a beast simply represents an earthly power. We look at this all the time in relationship to earthly powers today. For example, if we look at the nation of China, we, we identify China in the symbol of a dragon. Uh, Amer America is symbolized by an eagle. Uh, England is symbolized by a lion, Russia by a bear. So God is simply using that same term terminology, the same symbolism that, that we use, that mankind uses. Once we understand the symbolism, we need to shed that and get literal. We're talking about an earthly power here. Satan is working through an earthly power. He worked through the earthly power of pagan Rome to try to destroy Christ. And now he's giving his seat and authority and power to another earthly power that rises up in the wake of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and pagan Rome. And when we look at the history, there's only one power that fits that description. Let's continue to read uh, the quarterly here. About this beast power, we're told the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. This prophecy was precisely fulfilled hundreds of years later when the Roman Emperor Constantine moved his capital from Rome to what came to be called Constantinople or modern day Turkey. This left a power vacuum in the former throne or seat of the Caesars, the imperial city of Rome. Thus pagan Rome gave the beast the next earthly power, its seat or capital city. Isaac Bacchus stated, by removing the east to the east of the empire, or excuse me, by removing the seat of the empire to Constantinople, Constantine made way for the Bishop of Rome to exalt himself above all men upon the earth and above the God of heaven. And that's quoted in Leroy Froome, Edward Leroy Froome's book, The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, volume three, page 213. The quarter continues on, quarterly continues on. According to Thomas Hobbes, the papacy is no other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon the grave thereof. And that's New York Oxford University Press, 1966. It continues, a careful analysis reveals that the sea that the sea beast of Revelation 13 is an apostate religious power that rises up out of Rome and becomes a worldwide system of worship, Revelation 13, 3 and 4. The beast is not a person, it is a religious organization that substitute the truth of God's word for human decrees. So we're seeing here in Bible prophecy, the symbolism that identifies earthly powers as beasts, moving through history, the next beast that receives the powers from the previous is papal Rome. And the dragon, pagan Rome, identified in Revelation chapter 12 as, as the power, the earthly power that sought to destroy Christ as soon as this was born, gives its seed and power to pagan Rome, to papal Rome in Rome, in the capital of its old empire. It moves east to Constantinople and is replaced by papal Rome, and papal Rome then grows and becomes a worldwide power. Now there are identifying marks of this earthly power. And I believe Pastor Loma King is going to start identifying or start connecting us with those identifying marks. Today's lesson identifies one of those marks as blasphemy, which is claiming to be able to forgive sins or claiming to be God on earth, according to John chapter 10, verse 33, and Luke chapter 5, verse 21. Those examples are found in relationship to Christ, who was accused of blasphemy and claiming to be God, though they were not uh, 
true because Christ was God and Christ could forgive sins, but for a man, a human system to be able to do that, that would be blasphemy. So that's one of the marks that helps solidify this transition from pagan Rome to papal Rome. I believe Pastor Loma Cain is going to hone in on the rest of those marks. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Pastor Chindi. Thank you, uh, Pastor James. You know, I want to begin in Revelation 12 because I have Identifying the Beast Part 2. Revelation 12 begins with what I call a preamble to Revelation chapter 13. And for many years, I wondered why this statement was there because I don't live in the sea. And, um, and I wondered, well, why would the Bible say what it did in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12? And my continued study, I discovered that Revelation 13 was being introduced in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12. Notice these words of John the Revelator. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. Well, last I checked, I don't know of anybody who lives in the sea outside of fish or sea creatures. So why would there be a woe a warning to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. And is it coincidental or providential that the very next chapter speaks of the earth and the sea? It begins with the sea beast and then the earth beast. And, and um, Ryan is going to talk about the earth beast. And so these two warnings are, I believe, preambles to say what's coming next. Let's focus on what's happening in the sea beast what's happening in the earth beast because the woe is to woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the inhabitants of the sea. And when you look at prophecy, the rise of Rome began in the sea. Daniel talked about a vision he had and he says, and the waters were raging and the four beasts that rose in the vision of Daniel seven rose up out of the sea. But the fourth one, the Bible says was diverse or different from all the others. And what made Rome so different? Rome began, began as a pagan political power that metamorphosized into a pagan religious power. Notice I use the word pagan in both instances because it didn't really change into a Christian power. It just put on Christian garments. It baptized paganism because its beliefs continued in the same vein as it did when it was pagan. You go to the Vatican City today, where my wife and I was there just last year, and you stand in the courtyard looking at this monolith, and you come to realize that before this was gifted to the powers of Rome by, uh, by the Lateran Treaty in 1929, it was a different location. It had a different purpose. It was a center of pagan worship. And from the aerial view, you can see the round circle and all of the statues that are standing there that now Rome claims to be apostles and prophets. They had no such designation when it was built. Mm -hmm. But you find today that these things that are pointed out in scripture and the reason why prophecy is so vitally important is because the Lord does not want his people to be caught off guard concerning final events. I, I surely would never forget the uh, illustration that Daniel used about the trap. Surely this is not something that just happened recently or in the last hundred years, but this has been a trap that has been classically set from the time Satan made the statement, I will be like the Most High. Mm -hmm. And what is the most uh, honorable thing to do to, for the Most High is to worship him. The issue always has been and always will be about worship. And so let's look at uh, Amos chapter 3, verse 7. I'm going to take a little different approach because there's so many angles. We could just take Revelation chapter 13 and do two hours on it, but we don't have that luxury. First of all, the Lord wants his people to be aware of what's coming. Amos chapter three, verse seven, the Bible says, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveal his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Yeah. So Daniel and Revelation are revelations to his servants, the prophets. It's pulling back the curtain, peeling back the onion skin, diving deeply into the artichoke to find out what's at the heart of the issue. And at the heart of the issue are, is a power that was raised up to oppose God. Let's look at that. 
When Jesus ascended back to heaven, he left his church, the woman that's described in Revelation chapter 12. There was a woman in, Revel in, in Genesis chapter 3. And so when you look at the divisions of scripture, the serpent spoke to the woman and deceived her in Genesis chapter 3. Now he, he's angry with her in Revelation chapter 12 verse 17 because now she's listening to a different man. Mm -hmm. She's got the ear, of, there's another man has her ear and he comes to make the same proposal. He says, can, can we have a conversation? And she doesn't entertain him this time because she has an allegiance that's unshakable. And what is that? She keeps the commandments of God and she embraces the testimony of Jesus, which Revelation 19.10 says is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, she understands prophecy at the end of this scenario, at the end of the great controversy, better than she understood Satan's plottings at the very beginning. So she is not in the dark. And as we approach prophecy and the truth about the beast of Revelation, we know that when we talk about Revelation chapter 13, unequivocally the Bible is describing the resurrected beast, the resurrected power of Rome that received a deadly wound in the year 1798, but then that wound was healed and began to be healed in 1929 when the Vatican City was gifted by the Lateran Treaty. And so we see today, and I, I said, beginning to be healed. It's not completely healed yet because until the wound, until what caused the wound is reversed, the wound is not completely healed. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what caused the wound? The rise of the Protestant Reformation caused the wound. When Martin Luther protested against the dogmas of the church, he didn't just protest against the authority of the Vatican. He, he, pro he had 95 reasons. And so today there was a, a gentleman who's lost his life not too long ago by the name of Tony Palmer. He said, how can there be Protestants when the protest is over? Well, no, the protest is not over. The original protest is either salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone or salvation by works. Well, Rome had imposed upon people many, many works, which they still do to this very day. But he said, now that they say we are saved by grace through faith for good works, Rome presupposes to say to those who are Protestants, well, the protest is over. And then he says, there's only one church the mother church, the Roman Catholic Church. And so the Bible identifies this beast in Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. And notice what it says about its origin. Revelation 13, verse 2. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Before we go any farther to the end of the verse, why are these powers represented? Because it's a looking back. Daniel looked forward. He looked at the lion, the bear, the leopard. John is looking back, the leopard, the bear, the lion. And so as Rome is coming into view, into focus, into sharper focus, he is seeing all the powers that were removed to give prominence to this power. But there's something crazy that is being said about this power that was not said about any of the others, the lion, the bear, or the leopard. Notice the end of Revelation 13, verse 2. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Wait a minute. The very dragon that's angry with those who keep the commandments of God is the same dragon that gave Rome its power, its seat, and its great authority. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to peek into uh, Ryan's day here. Matter of fact, I'll let you talk about it. I know no, you're going to bring about the dragon. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. But the dragon is none other, Revelation 12, verse 9, that serpent of all called the devil and Satan. So he has a strategic plan from the garden to the second coming of Jesus. He wanted to be like the Most High, so he established on earth a power to buttress the power of God. What power of God? those who keep the commandments of God mm -hmm. and have the testimony of Jesus. And as Daniel pointed out, the special focus is the Sabbath. No Christian really wants to violate the other nine, but when you mention the Sabbath, somehow the spirit of evil comes to the surface and every illegitimate excuse non-supported by scripture is given because Satan wants the usurping authority. He wants to take the authority of God. He wants to be like the most high. That's right. And what does that mean? I want to be worshiped as the one who can create. He cannot create. He can duplicate by deception and mesmerism and illusions, but he is not the creator. So today, as we look at that, and I'm going to give Ryan the opportunity, but let me just say quickly, the origin of this power is satanic. The influence is worldwide, Revelation 13, 3, and all the world wandered and followed after the beast. Mm -hmm. 
What power do you know on earth that's religious and political that has the attention of political and religious leaders on the entire globe? What about its prominence? Revelation 13, verse 4, and they worship the dragon who gave power to the beast. When the powers of Rome are honored, it is an indirect honoring of Satan himself. And because we're in such critical times, we cannot really tiptoe through the tulips. And finally, it's anti-Christian dogma, Revelation 13, verse 5, and he was given him out speaking great things and blasphemies. What does that mean? Rome has usurped prerogatives that belong to God alone. Who can forgive sin but God alone? And the archbishops and the popes and the bishops claim to be able to forgive sin. So as we continue unfolding Rome's influence in the beast of the earth, I think that you'll begin to see that unequivocally we're living in the end and the trap has already been set. Mm. Mm, absolutely. Thank you guys so much. Powerful lesson and uh, such a great reminder of the times that we're living in today that we need to be fully focused on Jesus Christ to make sure that we know him today. You know, I want to begin my journey actually uh, in the scriptures uh, in Revelation chapter 13, uh, talking about the first beast because it's going to kind of set the foundation or the stage for this beast that comes up out of the earth. So let's look at the text there in Revelation chapter 13. Uh, by the way, my name is Ryan Day and I have Thursday's lesson entitled The Beast from the Earth. And so Revelation Revelation chapter 13, and I want to read, uh, just for the sake of, of uh, setting this up, I want to read verse 3. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3, speaking of this first beast, it says, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. All the world marveled and followed the beast. And as, as Pastor Loma King brought out so clearly and accurately, uh, that deadly wound has not completely healed yet. But we know that that deadly wound was given, it began to be given, or given obviously during the time of the Reformation, but it came to its fullness of uh, 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 fulfillment in 1798 when the Pope of Rome uh, was basically taken captive and through Napoleon Bonaparte and the uh, French government at that time, which ironically quite interesting, in 508 we see it's the French government helping to set up uh, the papacy to become the ultimate power that would rule supreme in 538 AD, thus beginning the 1260 year time prophecy or the 42 months that you see mentioned here that this beast would rule. But at the end of that 42 months, at the end of the 1260 day, Day prophecy or the 1260 year prophecy because a day for a year principle applies there. We see that in 1798 that deadly wound is given to the papacy where their political uh, and, and uh, uh, civil authority is taken away from them. They're just a church. That's all they are at this point. Uh, Napoleon took that away. That was an extremely deadly wound that was given to them at that time. And of course that wound has been healing over time. It's not quite fully healed yet, but it will be healed as we get down to these latter events of Bible prophecy. Now, that in keeping that text in mind, that deadly wound is given. That was around 1798. So notice the time frame here. As the first beast that came up out of the sea is going down, now there's another beast coming up around the same time out of the earth. And we'll find ourselves in Revelation chapter 13. And I just want to read through the text and then we'll talk about what these texts mean. So Revelation 13 verses 11 through 18. Notice what the Bible says. It says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all of the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound, there it is, was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Verse 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Verse 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark in their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one, 
may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And then the last verse here, verse 18, it says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man and his number is 666. Now we won't have time to address every single detail in these verses because this is a little mini series right here just in these, these few verses. But I do want to highlight the fact that we're going to clearly identify who this second beast is. Going back to Revelation 13, verse 3, as the first beast is going down in 1798, there's another power, another kingdom that is rising around this same time. And uh, notice how one of the first identifications there in verse 11, and in verse 11 of Revelation 13 is power packed full of some very, very important identifications to help us understand who this second beast is. First, notice how it's coming up out of the earth. As we were, have already brought out, uh, the sea beast coming up out of the sea, according to Revelation 17, verse 15, represents multitudes, nations, tongues, a, a large uh, mass populated area. But out of the earth would be the opposite of the sea, which would be sparsely populated regions. Uh, what nation or what power uh, is notorious for having begun or come up from a region of the earth that was sparsely populated or very uh, little populated? Uh, that is none other than the United States of America. Notice the time frame, 1798, which actually brings us to our second identification. It rises in and around the same time that this first beast deadly wound is given. Uh, the Declaration of Independence, for instance, was released or signed in 1776, declaring our independence, the United States' independence from Great Britain. But then, of course, the Constitution was drafted by 1789. And by the time you get to the turn of that, uh, uh, the, 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 the next century, 1798, 17, uh, all the way into the 17 uh, or eight, early 1800s, you're starting to see that United States of America is becoming known as a significant world dominant power at this time. There's no other nation, I want to really nail this home, there's no other nation that fits that, that description or fits that time frame. It has to be the United States of America. And by the way, before we move on to these other identifications, I just want to re-highlight what Pastor James brought out. The devil uses earthly powers. Mm -hmm. he, he is manipulating right. these earthly systems to do his deeds and to set the stage, as we're about to find out, for something even greater that he has planned as the ultimate deception of all. Notice how the first beast had the ten horns and the ten crowns upon those horns, obviously communicating, as it was told to us, uh, these, this, uh, this um, royal monarchy that is being ruled over in Western Europe. But this second beast has two horns, but it has no crowns on those horns, meaning that we're not dealing with a system or a power that is dominated or ruled by a royal monarchy, but rather a republic established on a democracy system. In other words, the people have the power, not one or two or three people ruling over or making the rules or, or, or drafting the laws. The two horns obviously represent a kingdom uh, and power within a kingdom, power and authority. So these horns represent something amazing. And I just want to read a couple of texts here. This comes from, actually I want to read one here from the Spirit of Prophecy, volume four, page 277. It says, and the lamb-like horns, emblems of innocence and gentleness, well represented the character of our government, speaking of the United States, as expressed in its two fundamental principles, republicanism and Protestantism, which the lesson does bring out, as uh, Pastor Mark Finley says, this talks about political and religious liberty. Well, that's exactly what this nation of the United States of America was built upon, republicanism and Protestantism, a Protestant nation. Notice the lamb likeness, and no one can deny the fact, and that brings us to our next identification, the lamb likeness. There's something that had two horns like a lamb. Obviously, if you look at this nation, it was founded and considered in the beginning, especially in its origins, as a Christian nation. Now, many obviously we have a dark past and there's things that have happened in this nation that we're not proud of and was very much not Christian, but more like a dragon as we're going to go on and see in just a moment. But of course, you look at our Declaration of Independence. You read upon our money in God, we trust the Pledge of Allegiance, you know, one nation under God. You read our leaders' memoirs and journals and speeches. You just simply go to Washington, D.C. and look at the monuments and buildings and you can see that there was a very, very strong and have been in this nation a very strong strong Protestant uh, Christian uh, influence from early on origins until now. So there's that lamb likeness that fits, of course, none other than the government of the United States or the nation of the United States of America. But let's make no mistake, just as much as this nation may appear in some ways to be lamb-like, 
it is very much, it very much begins to speak, as we said, as a dragon. And it's interesting here that when you read Maranatha, page 207, it's interesting how those verses we read earlier, verses 12 to 14, where it talks about exercises all the authority of the first beast. He performs great signs that even makes fire come down from heaven. It's interesting that Mrs. White applies this to Satan himself, manipulating the first beast and the second beast. Who's behind these powers? It's, 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 it is, the yes, the papacy, Roman papacy, and the United States government. But who's the ultimate power behind these two? It's the devil himself. And notice how she applies these texts to the devil's miracles and impersonating Christ. She says here in Maranatha, page 207, the enemy is preparing to deceive the whole world by his miracle working power. He will assume to personate the angels of light, to personate Jesus Christ. So far as his power ex extends, he will perform actual miracles. And then she quotes Revelation chapter 13, verse 14. She, she says here, and he says, he deceiveth them that dwell upon the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do. And she says, not merely those which he pretends to do, something more than mere imposture is brought to view in this scripture, but there is a limit beyond which Satan cannot go. And here he calls deception to his aid and counterfeits the work which he has not power actually to perform. In the last days, he will appear in such a manner as to make men believe him to be Christ come the second time into the world. And so my friends, when we look at this, 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 this series of studies of the first beast and the second beast, we see that the devil is the really the true power behind these beasts. He's behind the United States and he's setting the stage for his arrival and for the greatest deception of all. That's why now more than ever, we need to make sure that we're rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Amen. Wow. Thank you each for guiding us through these important topics. We have time here just for a couple closing comments. Thank you so much. A crisis is coming and these things we have shared, it is our hope and prayer that will help you to be prepared for the coming crisis. Amen, amen. And there are some identifying marks that we've just begun to uncover in Revelation 12 and 13. There's 10 of them that will be in the Sabbath school notes that you can get that connect Daniel chapter seven with Revelation chapter 13. Look for those. And also when we look at what's happening in our world today, it's so vitally important to know that God has not lost control. Matter of fact, he told us ahead of time, Isaiah 46 verse nine to 10, this is what's coming. Remember the former things of old, for I'm God and there is no other, declaring the end from the beginning. So God is informing you so that you do not have to be in darkness and that this trap is not set and you do not become a victim of what's happening in our nation and in our world today. Amen. I just want to read this last day of events, page 167, goes along with my lesson. It says, Satan will come to deceive, if possible, the very elect. He claims to be Christ and he is coming, pretending to be the great medical missionary. He will cause fire to come down from heaven in the sight of man to prove that he is God. But as Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So place your trust in Jesus and you will be safe when that time comes, knowing that you've rooted and grounded yourself in the vine of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Throughout this quarter, you've been hearing us talk about and read from the book, The Great Controversy. If you don't yet have a copy of that book, give us a call here at 3ABN this week, and we will send you a copy to your home for free. I just want to share with you this promise from Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Come back again next week for lesson number 12, Earth's Closing Events.